Good morning and greetings in Jesus' name. Fill my cup, Lord. Let me take a drink. <laughs> wow. I'm convinced that the gospel is the most uh, positive thing that has ever happened in this negative the world that we live in. Ever since our, father, our mother and father of us all reached outside of God's provision and took and became a destroyer of life instead of a giver of life. The gospel is the most positive thing that has ever happened. It's that which changes us from a taker, from a destroyer of life into a giver with what God has given to us. So let's pray here before we start. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful here this morning for the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And that's the only reason that we're here this morning. There is nothing else that's worth coming together for except for the gospel. The Lord Jesus has given his life for us. And we believe that if God is for us, who can be against us? And if God didn't spare his only son, but gave him up, offered him up for us, how much more will he not freely give us all things? And we believe that, Lord, and we declare that, that to be true this morning. You are for us, not against us. And so, Father, help us this morning to have our eyes open to see the beauty of the gospel, the incredible privilege that is ours to enter into the gospel, to be channels of the gospel through which you can flow and we can become life givers instead of life takers. We can be creators of life instead of destroyers of life. Thank you for the gospel. It's all in you, Lord Jesus. You are the source of life. And there in the book of Acts, it says that, I think it might have been Peter, says that uh, you have killed the very source of life. And... Um, that very source of life, his side was opened up and the water and the blood flowed out and the body of Christ was formed. And so, Lord, here we are this morning and I pray in Jesus' name that you would just show us the beauty of the gospel of our Lord Jesus here this morning. I give my heart to you and I pray that you would guide my mouth in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> well... Was it uh, just last week that Emmanuel talked about the gifts uh, out of Ephesians 4? The gifts and uh, how that God's heart is for these gifts to be used in the body for us to bless each other so that we can uh, be built up in, the, in love and walk in love with each other. Emmanuel asked us the question, um, sort of gave us an example of, um, well, he asked the question, if... Do we believe that God, let me see, I wrote it down here. Is it possible that, that uh, we have gifts from the Lord that we are not using? Is it possible that I have a gift from the Lord that I'm not using? My question is, if so, if I have a gift from the Lord that I'm not using, why? If so, why? Do I not believe that the gift is good? Do I not believe that the giver of the gift is good? Why is it not being useful in my life to bless others, to build others up? And Emmanuel kind of gave us that hypothetical example, if you will, of his son. Maybe uh, he gave him a, a chainsaw. And year after year, Emmanuel comes back and sees this chainsaw just wrapped in its original wrapping there on the shelf, whatever. And it's not being used. It's not being useful. And so his son never really fully received the gift for himself. And it was not useful to anyone. If there are gifts in my life that are not being useful, why? You know, there was a time in my life that I could tell that there's something deep within me, deep down within me, that is there that, that God wants to use, but he's not able to. And I had to ask myself, why? Why am I in a position, why am I in, in a place of life where God is not able to use this gift that I can tell is there, but it's somehow, it's wrapped, it's covered. What is it wrapped with and why is it wrapped? So, um, of course, my mind went to a um, parable that Jesus gave. I think it's in, in Matthew 25 as well as in Luke 19. Why don't we turn over to Luke 19 where we see this parable and in this parable we see um, what has been given. We see uh, one individual wrapping it and it's not useful. 
So Luke 19 and verse 11 is where this starts. And so uh, Jesus said this parable. It says he added this parable. It's just after the, the interaction with Zacchaeus there. And he added this parable. And uh, it says, because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because that they thought the kingdom of God should appear immediately. So he gave him this parable. It says, well, he said, a certain man, verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called his ten servants and delivered to them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come, or do business till I come, as it says in one translation. But what did his citizens do? They hated him and they sent a message after him and said, Listen to what they said. We will not have this man to reign over us. We will not give ourselves under this man. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, so that he might know how much every man had gained by trading, by doing business, by investing. Then came the first, saying, Lord, your pound has gained ten pounds. And he said, Well done, thou good servant, because you have been faithful in very little have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Well, be thou also over five cities. And then here comes the guy with the, what was invested in him, and it was wrapped. Why was it wrapped? What inspired him to keep this thing wrapped, or to wrap it? Verse 20, Another came, saying, Lord, behold, here's your pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin. And why? He said it. He said why he did it. He said, I feared you because you are an austere, <clears throat> excuse me, an austere man. You take up what you didn't lay down. You reap where you didn't sow. And so this is what he believed about his Lord. Was what he believed true? Well, what, what was the Lord's response? Since... In my own words, since that's what you believed about me, I'm going to judge you according to what you believed about me. You believed that I was a taker and not a giver. I'm going to judge you accordingly. Out of your own mouth, verse 22, will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew, and I'm going to say, I'm going to suggest, you believed me to be an austere man, taking up that I did not lay down, reaping what I did not sow. Why didn't you give my money to the bank? Then at my coming, I might have required mine own with usury, with interest. And he said to them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that has 10 pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 pounds. Then Jesus says, for I say to you, that unto everyone that has shall be given. And from him that has not, even that which he has shall be taken away. And those enemies, which didn't want me to reign over them, bring them over here and slay them in front of me. What inspired this man to keep his gift wrapped? What was behind him keeping his gift wrapped? It was based on what he believed his Lord to be like, wasn't it? Lord, I can't trust you. You're a taker. You're not a giver. I can't trust you. And therefore, I'm going to just wrap my gift up and keep it. So... In the gospel, the incredible gospel that we have in Christ Jesus, where everything has been given so freely for us to be able to be a giver, and God has invested in us this gospel, what is it that keeps us from receiving it and being an investor? One who, when the Lord comes, will be found faithful, investing what the Lord has given 
into my life. And I, I think I already alluded to the verse there in Romans. The Apostle Paul laid out the beauty of the gospel there in Romans so incredibly. And he came to a conclusion that the only reasonable thing to do in verse 1 of chapter 12, the only reasonable thing to do is to present my body as a living sacrifice. It's just my reasonable service. What is it based upon? Based upon the goodness of the gospel that he was writing about in the first all the beautiful chapters before that. The incredible beauty of the gospel where God has provided a place for me to be justified and stand there forgiven because of Jesus, because of the blood. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And the Apostle Paul's conclusion is, it just makes sense to present my body as a living sacrifice. Now notice these guys here in this parable. Um, they said, we will not have this man to reign over us. It says, uh, let's see, let's go back a little bit here. It says in verse 14, right at the beginning of the parable, it says his citizens hated him. Now that's not some, some language that we would use. And by the way, who is the Lord in this parable? Shout it out. Jesus, right? He came. So there he was giving the parable because some thought, you know, he's going to establish his kingdom right now. He says, no, what I'm looking for right now is I'm looking for those who are going to be faithful, whom I can invest in, who are going to give a return upon investment. When I come back and I can receive this kingdom, I'm looking for faithful servants who are going to be faithful with what I give. That's what I'm looking for now. And then I'll be coming back for those faithful servants. And they're going to actually join in my kingdom because of their faithfulness with what I have invested in them. And so they say, some say, we're not going to have this man to reign over us. And we could say maybe that's what that guy at the end said that had his gift wrapped. I'm not going to have this man to reign over me. I'm not going to present my body a living sacrifice. I don't trust you, Lord. You're a taker. You're not a giver. Well, the Lord had given him what he had, right? And yet he believed the Lord to be a taker. So based upon his belief of who God is, he left his gift, gift wrapped. He wrapped it in a napkin based upon that. Is it any wonder that the writer of Hebrews says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is not out to take. But I wonder what you feel like in your heart when you think of the thought of surrendering, yielding my life as a daily living sacrifice, presenting my body as a living sacrifice every day. Is it safe? Can I trust the Lord? You know, I felt for a long time that I do want to trust the Lord. And something that... Um, but it felt like there's something there that just keeps me from just completely, totally trusting. And so some of my cousins, back when we got married and, you know, we got married in Indonesia and then we came back to the States and we had this little reception here like a month later, um, back in 2011. And some of my cousins back here where the old sound booth used to be, they were like, <laughs> I'm not sure what inspired them to do this, but they had me do this like faith fall thing where they stood like this, you know, with their arms kind of like into each other on both sides. And I'm supposed to <laughs> fall backward in their arms. Whoa, that was kind of freaky. <laughs> to completely trust them that they're going to catch me. Like I would have hit the concrete carpeted ground back there behind the sound booth really hard if they wouldn't have been there to catch me. And that little feeling that I had was the feeling that I sort of felt when it came to saying, when I could feel the Lord saying, you know what? Yield yourself. Surrender yourself. Just trust me with your life. That little nagging thing of what if. 
What if the Lord's not there for me? What, is he, what if he's going to let me down? I did the fall, and they caught me. <laughs> but yeah, that, I, could just, I could identify that same feeling in my heart when it came to just yielding myself to the Lord. And so before we got married, I could tell that uh, the Lord was nudging me. I remember just specifically walking out the driveway and, um, you know, thinking of just entering into marriage and just the life changes that that will bring. So wonderful and good, new phase of life. Now I'm never going to be the same. And um, time is moving on. And I just felt this little nudge. Abner, um, surrender, surrender. And then I even specifically, and I was not thinking about this at all, but I specifically felt a nudge in a certain area to surrender. And that little thing was the thing that I was like, oh, no, I wouldn't want to. Part of that has to do with being in leadership now. No, I didn't want that. Lord, if I surrender completely, what if I get into that uncomfortable position that I don't really like? It's not comfortable to be one of the leaders. I don't, I don't like that. I would rather just pull back. But what if that's what the Lord wants me to do? What if the Lord is actually wanting me to humble myself and yield myself to him so that he can use me the way he wants, me to, wants to use me? And so I, sh- I just pulled back a little bit. Four years later, uh, my wife and I, we go back to Indonesia and we're there at the same hotel that we were at um, after our wedding. And, you know, we're talking about this thing of surrendering and I'm still just feeling this little bit of like, ah, not sure. You know, I, I mean, Lord, yes, 99.9%, it's yours, but you know what? That's less than what he wants, isn't it? But I just want that 1% just in case it gets uncomfortable, I can always pull back. It's like, no, no, I want it all. I want it all. I want everything. I want your whole being, your whole body. So my wife says, so if, if you feel the Lord nudging you to yield and surrender, then why aren't you able to? And so then I have to ask myself, why? Why? So I would never say, Lord, I don't surrender. I'm not going to surrender to you because I hate you. I would never say that like it says here in this parable, would I? But what would I do to kind of maybe show it a little bit? Lord, I don't trust you. If I yield myself to you, what if you take advantage of me? If I yield myself to your way, what if you're going to take instead of give? Well, that's not who the Lord is, is he? He's a giver. And we see that in the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So what does it take to unwrap the gift deep within me so that it's usable in God's kingdom to further his agenda and not my own? To further his kingdom and not mine. You know, if I want my way, Instead of his way, it won't work, will it? And I realized as I went through life that all of those things in life, whether it was at my job, all those things that were just not quite the way I wanted them to go, and I was just constantly kicking up against those things, you know, everybody else was the problem, why my life wasn't quite the way I liked it, and my why... You know, there was difficulties, and is that guy just one of this and that and the other thing? And I realized when I finally came to the point of completely saying, Lord, actually, Lord broke my heart, saying, Lord, here I am saying something with the way I'm living my life that I would not say with my mouth. I wouldn't say I hate you. I wouldn't say I don't trust you, but I'm living it. And so when my heart just broke over that, and I saw the Lord has is on my side. He has given me everything that pertains to life and godliness. I just broke my heart over that and yielded. Um, Where was I going with that? Anyway, yeah, just I felt something release in me that wasn't released before. All of a sudden, it just released, released. Oh, I realized, okay, all those things in my life that I just would constantly kick up against and find myself hitting 
the wall with and things like that. And I'm getting frustrated because life's not going my way. You know, even good things that I would like to see, but it's just not happening. And it's not going my way because I wanted to be in control. His citizens sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. No way. I want to be in control. I can't trust you, Lord. I can't yield myself to you. You're a taker. I don't believe you're a giver. See how that lie kept that man from unwrapping his gift? The lie. That age-old lie. Back in the garden. Oh, Lord, you said don't eat of that tree. You provided everything that we need for life eternal in this garden, but mm, we're not so sure. You know, when that destroyer came along and said, you know, tempted them to eat of the tree, and so there was a reaching out and taking. And ever since that, we just, you know, we got out of the garden by believing that our way is going to bring life. And we get back into the garden as we see in the book of Revelation in the end, by not believing that my way is right, but God's way is right, your way is right, and I yield myself to his way. And the gospel, it's all wrapped up in the gospel. It's all wrapped up in Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. And as we receive this gospel for ourselves, we become these life-giving channels everywhere we go. Just like Jesus said there in John 7. He says, whoever believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water, life-giving streams. And this he spake of the spirit, which those that believe on him should receive. So what does it mean to truly believe and receive the Lord Jesus? What does it mean? And what kind of an effect will it have in my life? I believe it will change me from a life taker, from a life destroyer to a life giver. See, what happened there in the book of Acts when the church first uh, was, came into being? Everyone, no one said, me, mine, my stuff. Nobody did that. They, they all had everything in common. It was for the benefit of the community, wasn't it? There was no one that said, this is mine. No, this is... What were they so free of that enabled them to say, I don't even need to hang in, on to any of my stuff of life. What were they so free of? Were they free from love for themselves? What were they filled with that freed them so much? What were they filled with? You know, and then we see Ananias and Sapphira coming. And what do we see in them? It doesn't say it in so many words, but they kind of were concerned about, uh, we would like to join this community, but, ooh, what about me? I might need to kind of take care of myself too here. What about me? I better keep a little bit of it for myself. Hmm. What did not happen in their heart that happened in the rest? In the rest who said that uh, none of the things that I have are mine. It's here for the benefit of the community. What did not happen in Ananias and Sapphira's heart? What did they believe about God that kept them or that inspired them to keep a little bit for themselves? He that believeth on me, out, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake of the spirit, which those that believe should receive. In John 1, and maybe we can turn over there a little bit. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, John, the gospel of John. It starts out kind of in that first chapter. Saying that, you know, he came to his own in verse 11. 
He came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And what does it mean to believe? To receive him? It says, he gave them power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. To truly believe and receive him. Now, if the gift that God has invested in me is there, but it's not being used, should I, is the answer just to say, well, I got to just go out there and make this thing useful? Maybe. Maybe I'm loving myself and that's not why it's not useful. Maybe I'm not believing God for who he is and maybe that's why it's not useful. But is that where it starts? I believe the, the Holy Spirit specifically inspired the Apostle Paul to write the book of Romans in the order that he did and so many of his letters. The book of uh, Ephesians, the first chapter, he writes of, about the beautiful place of acceptance that we have in Christ Jesus. God has made us accepted in the beloved. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Out of that place of security, there we can now, uh, we can now actually use these gifts that God has given us to bless. And instead of like Ananias and Sapphira, sort of, you know, we give, but we're sort of a taker in the midst of our giving. We can actually be free like the rest of the group was, who actually was there with completely open hand, with nothing for me in it. I'm not here for what I can get out of the community. No, I'm not here to try to protect myself. I'm just here. But what if I get taken advantage of when I join the community? What if I get taken advantage of? What if I should just lay up a little bit for me, just in case? But you see how it goes right back to my, if I believe that God is good. You know, Jesus says, look, you guys can actually trust me. Like, I've got you covered. You're worth more than many sparrows. I mean, I've got all your hair numbered. And in the end, it's going to be as though you haven't even lost one hair. Like, I'm such a giver. I'm such a giver. And you can actually trust me. That's who I am. So don't worry about what you're going to lose. We don't have to worry what we're going to lose, even if we lose our physical life. It's, we're going to get such an incredible return. He that seeks to save his life shall lose it, which is what this guy did with the gift wrapped in a napkin. He lost even that which he had been given. But he that loses his life for my sake in the gospel is going to find it. So my interaction with the gospel, my acceptance of the gospel for myself, and my walking in, the, in that acceptance opens up the possibility for me to be so free of me that I don't have to be in it for what I can get out of it. Which is really, it's that new vessel that we need to function out of instead of the old wineskin, which if we try to function out of and we try to keep this thing together and it's not working very well and it's busting apart and then we try to patch it again and it's still not working well and we keep on going through life and ooh, we got this thing under control now and it's, you know, it's boiling underneath there and it's, it's not working out too well but uh, after, every once in a while, oh, it, the thing's busting open again and we got to get this thing patched up again and then, you know what? Well, how about just trashing that old one and functioning out of the new? Just letting go of the old. But you know, Jesus said, no man's going to straightway desire the new. He's going to say, ah, the old is better. I, mean, I was born with this. This is what's familiar with me. It's just as uncomfortable for me to let go of the old and take a hold of the new. It's just too uncomfortable. But what if I would trust God for who he is? And it's safe to let go of the old. What if it's really safe and he's trustworthy? What if he's really on our side? What if I would truly believe that God is who he says he is. And I would let go of the lies that have formed in my heart and mind over the years because of all the deep painful things I've faced. And I, and I begin to believe lies about who I am, about who God is. What if I would just let go of all that and I'd say, no, God, you are good. Yes, you are good. 
I'm trying to hold this thing together. It's not working out. Lord, I trust you. Oh, Lord, I've been living my life in a way that says I hate you instead of I love you. In a way that says I love my own life. I'm going to have to keep this thing together. So maybe I've never had that exchange in the first place. And I find it very difficult to live the Christian life because I'm trying to stuff it into the old life, my way, with my agenda, me in control. And it's just not working. I mean, I can tell, you know, the way I respond to authority in my life, physical, earthly authority, my boss or whatever. Something's there that's just, you know, a little bit off. I kind of want to do my thing, and they can tell. And I'm about to lose my job, or I lose points on the bonus reward program. Hmm. What's the problem? You know the same thing that's my problem with my relationship with my Heavenly Father? is the same thing that's going on there in my earthly authorities relationship. I want to be in control, right? I might have some good ideas, but what if the boss says, do it this way? Who's in control? Am I going to be in control? I'm, t I'm talking out of um, <laughs> walking through that myself. And you know what changed all of a sudden in my heart? When this view of God's authority and God being good and I can trust him and I can yield myself to him, you know what? My relationship with my earthly authority has changed too. That was interesting. I didn't even have to try to make that change. It just changed. God wants to change me from a life taker, a life destroyer kind of a servant to a life giving servant. One who has his gift unwrapped, it's available, it's free to be used. But what if I'm not secure in my identity with my Heavenly Father? And then I face rejection in my attempt to use my gift. What if Jesus would have not been secure with that smile over his life there at his baptism where he, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he had that smile over his life? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What if he, he would have not had that security? How would he have fared as he went along? He's like, what? They're trying to kill me? They're, they're, they're actually plotting? How would he have responded in that? Whoa, they're just rejecting me. I have had enough of it. But he had that security, didn't he? And out of that, you know, he says to the, to the, to the Jews there, I believe in John chapter 5, he says, look, guys, I mean, they, they come to him and they're like challenging him on his authority. And he says, <laughs> he's there going back and forth. And finally, he says, about in verse 40, 41, he says, look, guys, he says, I don't receive honor of men. I don't receive honor of men. I'm not here ministering trying to receive honor of men. Not at all. I, I receive the honor that comes from God only. And he says, I know you guys. You don't have the love of God in you. He says, I came in my Father's name. And you don't receive me. But if someone else were to come in their own name, oh yeah, you'd receive him. Mm-hmm, you would but I didn't come in my own name. He says, I know you guys. You don't have the love of God in you. What were they filled with? If they weren't filled with the love of God, even in the midst of all their good doings, probably love for myself, right? You see why the Apostle Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3, you know what? I can give, I can give and give and give and give and give. 
even, I can give all my money to the poor, all my goods to the, feed the poor, even my body to be burned. And if I don't have love, it's worth zero. If I don't have the love of God in me, who do I love? Is it myself? Who do I love even in the midst of all my good giving? Like Ananias and Sapphira. Who do I really love? Who am I trying to protect? And so, isn't it no wonder why the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write the book of Romans and the book of Galatians and others in the way he did? First, the gospel. Get secure in that. Believe God for who he is. And uh, get established in that. And then out of that, we can actually use these gifts and they can be useful. And I'm not in it, kind of like the guys there, uh, chapter 7 of Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. I'm not in it to try to find my acceptance. I'm not giving so I can try to somehow find my security and identity. No, I can just follow Jesus who was secure in that identity. I have the witness that I am a child. My heart's crying out, Abba, Father. And I don't need man's approval. You know what the Apostle Paul says there to the Galatians? He says, he says, look, hey, I, if I should yet be seeking to please men, I'm not the servant of Christ. I can't be both. If I'm somehow trying to, like the Jews there, Jesus addressed in John 5, trying to somehow gain approval and honor of men with what I do, I, I really can't be the servant of Christ. And so, how can you believe that receive honor one of another, Jesus says, and seek not the honor that comes from God only? It is such an incredible honor to be a child of God, to be changed from a life taker, from a life destroyer to a life giver. It is so incredible. But you know, if I love myself, I can't do that very well. Take a look at... Um, Flip over to Matthew, where we see uh, a faithful servant, and by implication, an unfaithful servant. Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus, you know, got done talking to his disciples about how it's going to be when he comes back, and the, uh, just the, uh, the need to be prepared, to be on your guard, watching and praying. Matthew 24, toward the um, end, verse 45, he says... Uh, you know, he kind of gives the warning about not just doing life and business as usual, you know, like it was uh, in the days of Noah, you know, just eating and drinking. Just life is just wonderful and good. It's all about me and my nice life. Watch out for that. You know, there's going to be division. Those kind of people are not going to be taken. They're going to be left behind. And then he, in verse 45, he says, now, I have this question. He says, who's going to be that faithful servant? That faithful servant, verse 45, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household. Or uh, I think uh, maybe the literal idea there is the life-giving plan. His Lord has made ruler over a life, the life-giving plan to give them their meat in due season. Who's going to be that life-giving servant? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say to you, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Faithful. Faithful with the investment that God has given me. Faithful to be a life giver with what God has given me. But on the other hand, ooh, what does he say in verse 48? If that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him and in an hour when he is not aware and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you know, and so, it's, so it's like this contrast between a life-giving servant and a life-taking servant. The one is consumed with me, uh, the life of self, and it actually calls him an evil servant. You know, self-life is evil. It's the kind of like the life of, of a of a goat who is just concerned about me, myself, and I, as we see there in uh, chapter 25, where Jesus is talking about the judgment. And there's a difference between the goats and the sheep. The sheep were into being a channel of life for others. So much so that they were like, wait, Lord, you mean we did that? Oh, yeah, I guess, hmm. Was their identity maybe not even wrapped up in their service to others? No, it was, it was like, wow, this was just like, this was just what was coming out of this new vessel. 
you know, and the goats were like, just kind of living for themselves. Like he's like, you didn't do it, he says. But you know, there's coming a day. There's coming a day when, when uh, God is going to reward. Uh, back there in, in Revelation chapter chapter 11, there's coming a day. The day of judgment is coming when God's going to bring reward and destruction based on whether I was a giver, a faithful servant, or kind of a taker, kind of a destroyer of life. A giver of life or a destroyer of life. So in chapter 11, um, he says in verse 18, the nations were angry and your wrath is come and the time of the dead so that they should be judged and that you should give reward unto your servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear your name, small and great. So those servants are going to get a reward. But on the other hand, he says in the last part of the verse, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. You see that? It's like, am I a life, am I a faithful servant who's going to get the rewards in the end when the Lord returns to receive his kingdom? Right now, he's looking for investors who are going to be faithful, faithful givers. And, they, and those faithful channels of life will be rewarded in the end. There is rewards, incredible rewards, eternal rewards. But those who were kind of like the destroyer, kind of like a life taker instead of a life giver, are going to be destroyed. And then flipping over in the last chapter, we get right back into the Garden of Eden, which which man fell out of by trying to take. And we get right back into the Garden of Eden kind of a scene back there in in chapter 22 of Revelation. And it says in verse, oh, let's see. Here we see the servants. The servants, the faithful servants are going to be serving the Lord forever throughout all eternity. And it's in a life-giving environment. Those who have been faithful to be a channel of life here and now, in this time of occupation, in this time of doing business, in this time of doing trading, those who have been faithful channels of life are going to enjoy life forevermore back in the setting that's very much like the Garden of Eden. Verse 1 to verse 4, and then we'll close. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And there's God, the very source of life. It wasn't coming from behind him and through. It was God himself, the source, the Lamb. God himself and the Lamb, the source of this river of life. And verse 2, in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. Doesn't it sound so life-giving? Which bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And that healing of the nations idea is the same idea of uh, what we looked at there. And the difference between a... Uh, in Matthew 24, where there's the, the life-giving servant or there's the one that's sort of like beginning to smite and destroy. That who's going to be that faithful servant? God has made ruler over his household, over his life-giving plan. And so here it is, the life-giving plan, fully unleashed and fully realized in the presence of God forever in this incredible new heaven and new earth, the new Garden of Eden that, we get, that all the faithful servants get to enjoy. So there's the tree of life with 12 manner of fruits, yielding her fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for for the healing of the nations. And verse 3, there is going to be no more curse. The curse is completely removed. All that curse that created, that made all of us into such takers. Even the animal kingdom is such a taker. I mean, you go to the biggest and they just eat down through, don't they? It's such a taking, taking, taking life from each other. I mean, it's all going to be reversed. It's all going to be completely reversed. There is going to be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And where the throne of the God of God and the Lamb is, there's the very source of life coming right out, the river of life. And here it is. And his servants shall serve him. His servants shall serve him. The faithful ones who served him now, who believe that he is a good giver. He is benevolent. He is on my side. How shall he not freely give us all things? He has given his own son. He didn't spare his own son. And they have believed that he's good. He's not a taker. He's not out to get. I can yield myself to him. Yes, it's safe. 
He's trustworthy. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And here's the reward. We get to live with him forever and ever. And while we're here, we even get to be partakers of his life and channels of life. But you know, it costs me my life to be that channel of life, doesn't it? You know, I lose my life now faithfully for his sake and the gospel. And I think the gospel is something to be lived, not to be just spoken. We go and share the gospel. Yeah, we share the gospel with our mouth. Sure, but that's only, that's only, that words can be cheap. We can share the gospel with our mouth and people will be like, yeah, but you're not sharing the gospel with your life. And so, you know, people at my work or wherever I interact, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't look like the gospel. Remember Otto Koning? Finally, they were like, wait, he just became a Christian. (laughs) All of a sudden, he started living it. So let us be those faithful channels who believe that God is good. He is who he says he is. And who he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And let's live the gospel to each other. And the world is going to know. And they're going to say, what's going on here? Very likely, there's going to be some that are going to want to come and sort of in it for themselves but it'll show up eventually. But we can be the faithful channels, turning many, many to righteousness, shining the light by the way we live and interact with each other, being faithful, life-giving servants. God bless you.